Well, good afternoon, everybody. Today we have uh, Reed Bennett, who's going to be talking to us about biofuels and, in particular, biodiesel. Uh, one thing to note is that this talk is going to be on uh, Google Video, so if there's anything that you're going to ask that might seem proprietary in nature, uh, we ask that you come up afterward and talk to Reed about that stuff instead of in the regular question answer period. So I met uh, Reed, uh, I guess, about six months ago and uh, been talking to him uh, on and off about biodiesel. And I, uh, on the heels of the uh, Vinod Kosla talk, uh, who, who talked about ethanol, et cetera, I went over to, uh, to see him and we started talking about the differences between ethanol and biodiesel and a lot of other things. And it seemed very appropriate for him to come and maybe tell all of you about it and uh, keep the discussion going. So without further ado, Reed Bennett. Thanks, everyone. Actually, what Bill failed to say is he asked me a question and he got a two-hour answer, so I'll hopefully be a lot faster than that. So out of curiosity, how many people here were at the Vinod Kosla? And how many of you asked questions? Those were really good questions and you made me nervous. Um, how, about a, how many people uh, run biodiesel? We got two, three, four. Great. Okay. So uh, as my wife reminds me, I'm too old to be a graduate student at, the UC, at UC Davis, where I am the uh, biofuels graduate student. We just uh, received $20 million from Chevron yesterday, and uh, I wish I could get all of it, but uh, I'm sure there are going to be others following us. So after Google, if you want to get into it as a graduate student, I don't recommend it, but uh, you're welcome to talk to me about it. And actually, I have cards up here. And, I don't, you know, no question is too small. It's a great area and it's a lot of fun. So my outline, I'd like to suggest a solution so you know where I'm angling. Uh, talk about context, give you a whirlwind tour of transportation, talk about diesel engines, which I have a Jones for, a whirlwind tour of fuels, emissions, and why transportation is a crux issue. Talk about plug-in hybrids. I don't know if you saw the unauthorized announcement of Google.org saying they're big into plug-in hybrids. Uh, then get into an area related, which is after I've force-fed you all this stuff, talk about business models, my hypothesis that technology is not the key, it's business models. Uh, talk about examples of new paradigm business models and then give you some thoughts for Googlers. Uh, so cutting to the chase, I believe diesel, not gasoline engines, this thing called BTL, or biomass to liquid, or more technically known gasification of biomass and fissure trough liquids. liquids. Uh, and then finally, plug-in hybrid electric vehicles in any case. Plug-in hybrids, I believe, are the 85% solution, and biofuels is the 15% solution. If you add that together, you got 100%, right? So I won't go through all the risks and context, but the time is very ripe for things to happen. Despite the demagoguery, fear, apathy, mendacity, self-interest, or ignorance, I'm probably part of that too, uh, it's uh, hard to ignore. Funding spigots are open for alternatives, and for the clever, I think there's a way to make a buck and save the world. So some disturbing facts. You've probably seen this famous thing, which is over the last you know, 1,200 years, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere has been pretty stable, and then guess what happened once we industrialized? It's going off the roof. Now, cause and effect is, you know, the Bush administration might argue cause and effect, but it's interesting. Now, I'm sorry for this really kind of difficult uh, slide, but I couldn't s steal it from anywhere else other than badly done. But this basically shows uh, temperature variations. It's a standard deviation against a mean, and what you can see is approximately every 200,000 years or so, or maybe I've got that wrong, you get uh, dips and you get peaks. And so, uh, you know, I've, as part of, I'll tell you about myself, uh, as part of talking to the people, you know, that don't believe in global warming, I say to them, hey, even if you don't believe in it, we're in a warming trend and it's going to hit you hard. And as you remember those hot days back there, they tend to make people vote differently, scream differently, things like that. So even if you don't believe in global warming, I think it's going to warm up and people are going to make the obvious choice of, or decision of why. Uh, so you can tell how, I mean, you all know about Canadian oil sands or tar sands as they're called in some places. They're actually technically different, but I won't get into it. But Canada is Saudi Arabia. Thank goodness our friends. 
There's a break even at forty to fifty dollars a gallon, and you can't sequester. Sorry, you're right. Barrel, thank you. Any, please, uh, please uh, jump in. This was a two a.m., so I'm not going to get it all right. Uh, and you can't sequester at, in vehicles. And one of the things that people don't understand is this process itself uses a lot of water. So, talk, so you can see how bad it is for Canada in the sense that you know you can't even take a clear picture anymore on the right. No, actually, that's just a bad, bad screenshot. Uh, so another kind of issue that you know is probably politically based or maybe self-interest based of us is what is the true cost of petroleum? And so the best I can see in the literature and popular is if we really paid for all the incorporated all the externalities of petroleum, we'd be paying seven dollars and fifty cents to fifteen dollars a gallon, which sounds a lot like what they're paying in Europe, at least on the downside of that. And unfortunately, the statistics say people don't change their driving patterns. So who was the one who said, I'm, I'm a software guy during the day and a would-be economist at night? Is that person here that asked that question of Vinod? Uh, basically, there is zero demand elasticity, so that's not good. Uh, you know, some people would look at this as corporate average fuel economy standards. Some people would look at this as failure, meaning we haven't regulated our way into making cars more efficient. Uh, for the last 25 years. Well, first of all, cars are incredibly more efficient. It just goes into running all the parasitic loads, meaning tape decks, ice coolers, whatever else, right? They're incredibly efficient. They're incredibly cleaner. It's just there's more cars and there's more junk that we, pl pu that we plug into our cars. And uh, so what you can see is, I think the positive thing is regulation itself, if we could ever get it there, you know, is very powerful. Look what happened when you regulate at least, you know, the 1982 and prior. So whirlwind tour of transportation, it started at, uh, with your feet seven million years ago as the humanoids got going, and it ended kind of the last technological innovation was the diesel vehicles with diesel engines itself being invented in 1900. Uh, so uh, a quick vehicle comparison, again, as part of the drink from the fire hose, a spark ignition engine or a gasoline engine uh, operates at low compression uh, versus a diesel engine that the fuel self-ignites at high temperatures. And the fuel itself, uh, if any of you have taken the chemistry or remember back to it, it's shorter chain carbon atoms versus at C6 to C9, octane, C8, you know, remember your Latin, C14 to C18 for diesel fuels. And as I'll show in a slide, that's what plant oils are. They're magically at that you know, at that uh, applicability. So people say, well, the diesel, it's not fair. There's more energy in the, in the diesel, diesel, so you should discount for that. And I say, well, there's more diesel, and uh, you, you know, that's a bad thing that there's more energy in it. And then vehicle costs, of course, for gasoline and diesel versus electric and then hydrogen uh, you know, are significant, you know, significantly different. Infrastructure costs. Gasoline, diesel, uh, no difference. And you know, my dear friend, I'm sorry, it's my whipping post. Other than uh, other than ethanol, is like 200 to 400 billion dollars of infrastructure that would need to make it happen. Um, so uh, uh, you know, range is the killer for electric vehicles. I don't know what uh, Alec might say about that. Uh, and then miles per gallon. You know, these are approximate X's on either one. But you know, my short answer is you know. Uh, diesels are, you know, you have that efficiency gain of about 30%. So the compression ignition engine, the diesel engine, was demonstrated by Rudolf Diesel in the 1900s, and it was run on rancid peanut oil. So unfortunately, the diesel engine, to, com com to contain that heat and to contain that compression, had to have a lot of metal around it. So we needed to wait for, you know, 100 years until high-tech high metals could make the engine actually lighter. And so there's 30% better fuel economy, which is nice, high torque at low speed, uh, which is, you know, I would argue, or I think the statistics show how people buy their vehicles is they want the giddy up and go, I guess you would call it. And then in 1930s, the first implementation of a diesel engine in a, uh, in a vehicle was taking a, uh, a boat engine and, and, and putting it into a big limousine that could barely fit it. And so today, trucks primarily use it because they need high torque at low speed to get those big, um, the, the big vehicles going. 
So, you know, uh, it's not unrealistic to look to Europe and what they're doing in diesels. I mean, there's a huge penetration of light duty vehicles in Europe, up to 70%. Uh, and why? Because of fuel economy and their concerns because they don't have, you know, their own oil. And on top of it, for performance reasons. Uh, and then, you know, just some more statistics of, uh, if you wanted to look at CNG figures, they're just like a blip on the radar screen if you're fans of that technology. But either way, diesel is not something new and it's not something crazy, it's just not over here and there's some reasons in terms of, you know, California Air Resources Board, uh, blah, blah, blah. I can get into that maybe in the questions section, but you cannot buy a new passenger diesel vehicle in, in uh, the United, excuse me, in California today. It's got to have 7,500 miles on it, and there's a whole secondary market of 7,501 70, 7, miles uh, of used vehicles. So again, uh, you can see in this example kind of an apples to apples gasoline 2.0 liter and a diesel, significant more torque, uh, and you know, acceleration's the same, uh, and then fuel economy, you know, it's nice to have. Uh, and then how many people, here's my second kind of series of questions, who was born prior to 1976 in this room? Oh, wow, how come all the adults showed up? Um, <laughs> uh, you remember the old diesels, they are dirty and slow. Well, they're not that anymore, they're absolute rocket ships. People love them and, you know, again, I'd love to sell fuel economy and make the world, you know, join hands and sing. But uh, this is kind of how people in America buy cars, so it's not a bad thing. So now let's talk about a whirlwind tour of fuels. It all started with food, and then it started with fodder. If you know what fodder is, it's the stuff you feed animals. Then the battery came along, at least invented, then food for the bicycle, and then rail, you know, a series of things. Oil, Edison Electric, diesel engines uh, starting on peanut oil, electric vehicles, coal for the most part, gasoline vehicles, gasoline, diesel, vehicles diesel in the 1940s they realized hey we could put a thing called biodiesel which I'll talk about in a second into it and overcome some of the issues of just putting plain vegetable straight in oil straight into it which it works also as long as it's not coal. So the other thing too is this is nothing new at least in terms of uh, the present circumstance about foreign source uh, petroleum issues. You know 1970s and 80s it was all about ethanol. And I would just suggest it's kind of all about ethanol again. 1980s methanol, which had the disadvantage of being highly toxic, but you know, that didn't bother some people. Uh, 1990s to 2000s, you know, the gaseous vehicle, uh, if you want to call it that, uh, alternative. Electricity, some people know a lot about that in this group. And then kind of what, hydrogen. And uh, you know, uh, this is my one Jones is like, you know, what it, my one Jones is who's going to accept responsibility for hydrogen in, in that it's taken all the oxygen out of kind of alternatives and boy, it's a real tough sell, particularly if you buy my logic uh, that, you know, biofuels combined with plug-in hybrids is, you know, the way to go. So uh, this is just simply to show kind of see, you know, this is the chemical formulation of these various subcomponents of, of natural plant oils and you can see C16, C18, C18, you know, that's diesel fuel. So it's pretty, pretty, and uh, these are just percentages of that. And then there's a million, you know, there's kind of the resources, the conversion technologies, the fuels that they can be turned into, and I would say a lot of people miss the fact about what vehicle you put it into, and you need to go forward and backward off of the capabilities of the various vehicles. Uh, biodiesel itself, you know, it's, Think of the old time uh, soap making process. If you take plants or animal oils and you put them with a catalyst and you add alcohol, you get biodiesel. You know, again, you gotta, if you're gonna use like uh, restaurant grease, you might have to screen out the burritos or something like that. So that's, you know, immaterial on the thing here. If you add water, you get soap. So, uh, and you know, advantages in terms of energy balance, there's subsidies out there at least through 2008. Disadvantages is, and I'll show this in a second, there's significant limitations in terms of feedstock. I mean, it seems like seven billion, if you took all the Malaysian palm oil in the world and turned it into biodiesel, 
and nobody got to eat of the people that are dependent on that, then there'd be seven billion gallons of biodiesel. Unfortunately, we use 40 billion for this country alone. So, you know, and on the top of the ethical implications of, of, of using food for fuel. Uh, and here again is, let's say you were starting a business in biodiesel in California, you know, the fifth largest economy in the world, depending on, you know, whether the French are making cheese that month or not. And uh, what you've got is uh, you don't have a lot that's really available for biodiesel. And so much as I love it, and if you've got a local Chinese restaurant willing to give it to you and you don't you wear eye protection like your mom told you whenever you were playing with lye or something like that, it's great. But in terms of the future, it's really difficult because we use, in this state alone, about 4 billion gallons of the stuff diesel-wise and about 40 billion in the, the country. So now ethanol. Now, it's without, a, without you know, kind of competition, nothing's fun. So I, would call, I call ethanol uh, hydro, the hydrogen scam light. It seems to make a lot of sense, but just fundamentally, as you put all the pieces together, it makes a lot of sense for certain people. Uh, 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 it's you know, easy in the sense that GM doesn't have to do anything, which is always nice for them, and other than put a, a gas cap on or spend 200 bucks extra or something like that. But ultimately, what you have is you have, uh, you have sugar, which is really easy to turn into ethanol because you just go through the fermentation step, or you have these other complex sugars, which include a thing called hemicellulose, which is just a matrix loosely bound of sugars, cellulose, a more intense matrix, harder to break up, or lignin, which is at best you're gonna burn it for processed fuel or something like that. So you need to do hydrolysis, which is acid, heat, and or enzymatic treatment. And you know, I, what I, my argument of this talk is we can have this, the future is today, or you can bet on the future, which you know that's the inherent nature of this company here, but we need solutions fast. And if you take it all into account, you know, enzymes that are comp very specific, that haven't been invented yet, that require homogenous feedstocks, which is not the case, that's a big jump. So the, one of the things I think is worth talking about is I call it, um, you know, after my inflammatory remark about ethanol, or I think another inflammatory remark about hydrogen, the Brazil fallacy, right? Just because Brazil is on the equator, has all the sugar cane you could want, does not mean that is, a, that is a good reason to think about ethanol for the United States. Somebody in this room asked about kind of the longitudinal uh, issues of, uh, this is in the COSLA lecture, uh, the longitudinal issues, meaning how far from the equator and is ethanol right for, for the United States. You know, Brazil is the largest ma land mass in the world on the equator. Unfortunately, everybody wants to put something there that, you know, if you're going to display it, you're not gonna put ethanol where you grow, I mean, where you have uh, cows or something like that. You're gonna put it in rainforest if it's not already converted to ethanol. So just, you know, you can go through these issues yourself, but be very careful when, you know, they talk about selling you the, the Brooklyn Bridge or talking about Brazil or, you know, that type of thing. It's a special case, an entirely special case that only works with Brazil or maybe Malaysia or maybe Indonesia. And they just happen to be on the equator, which, you know, this biofuels is all about taking sun energy, and putting it into a biological capture element and turning it into fuel. And so you just take it with a grain of salt. Now, what I'm pushing here is this thing called biomass to liquid. And basically you take everything, you know, so remember that movie, Soil and Green? Soil and Green is people, you know? And uh, whenever my kids uh, bother me, I say, hey, you could be biofuels too if you don't behave. Um, <laughs> the, uh, you take it, you heat it at one third the oxygen for sufficient combustion, and it turns into a syngas. Now, for those of you who will not give up on hydrogen, let me say this is the precursor to hydrogen, you know, the hydrogen economy. We build this infrastructure for, uh, for the creation of biomass to liquid, you know, when all the other issues are solved with hydrogen uh, vehicles, particularly, is what this is all about, this talk is all about. We've got hydrogen and CO coming out as syngas. Now, there's a, and, and I think uh, Vinod mentioned this, uh, there is a 1920s, 1910 process called Fischer-Tropsch, 
which basically takes these separate molecules or groups of molecules and puts them over a catalyst and puts them back together into C18 diesel fuel or whatever carbon chain length you want. It just happens that the diesel fuel is kind of the most efficient way to put it together. You could make ethanol out of this, but it's a sub-optimized process. And you get what uh, V, yeah, go ahead. How many joules do you need to spend to, to get you know, like one joule? Yeah, fuel? well, the, what you're talking about is energy balance, which is like a gallon of, uh, you know, gallon of petrol in and how, many, how much energy you get out. Uh, you know, again, this is, this is all argument, uh, you know, the arguments are, as an example, ethanol is 0.75, meaning negative. If you add the fact that you can feed cows or livestock, you know, it goes above one and can go all the way. Even the people that, you know, you would think are, are the best you hear is 1.6 off of corn. And then biodiesel, you hear about 3.6, 4. And then uh, biomass to liquids up in the you know five to fifteen range, so it's extremely efficient. And this is not me talking. Where did, where did that so energy balance is that that was your question? Well, I guess my question was you know like how much energy are you spending in order to make a joule of right? Pipeline? So yeah, so let's let's put it in terms of gallons of gasoline, right? You put I mean excuse me a petroleum product. You put one gallon of petroleum product in to get, and you get 10 gallons of petroleum product out, okay? And, and it, all that comes out of the biomass that you've released very efficiently, you know, the energy that's inherent in the biomass. Yeah, you grow the biomass normally by cutting down trees or sugarcane or whatever. <clears throat> Correct. Yeah, so, you know, I, I mean, the point of this whole thing is if you have to choose between a a highly specific process that hasn't been invented yet or an omnivorous process, you know, net-net, you go with the omnivorous process. The difficulty of this and the advantage of this is that it's a, it's a process that, you know, deals with, it's, it's an oil company process. This is where the oil companies come in and say, okay, we got all the money in the world, we're forced to do this or we want to do this, depending on how you look at it. Uh, we're not gonna get involved in biodiesel, you know, there's not enough feedstock to even worry about it. Ethanol, we're worried about energy balances and stuff like that. You know, where do we do what we do best, which is beat it with a sledgehammer? And I, I'm arguing, and I've heard good confirmation, you know, this is where they want to go. And I would argue, you know, FYI, please look at it. Between this and using coal as a feedstock for a similar Right. Well, I mean, again, the original fisher trops process was a coal. I mean, this was the 1920, then, you know, the World War I Germans trying to find a way to, like, get around the fact that they're at war and it's tough to get Romanian oil. And World War II Germany also. And South Africa, you know, in the apartheid region, taking all their coal resources and avoiding the apartheid things. This is a, you know, this is a, pro the fisher trops process was invented for coal, and the issue of you know, the bio, doing it with biomass instead is a fun, you know, it hasn't been completely invented. There are demonstration projects that are fairly substantial. VW is doing this in combination with Shell and everything like that. Now, the real issue is, and this is why trans, this is kind of the underlying thing in terms of global warming is, if you put, uh, if you put, it's a, a sequestration problem. 600 million vehicles out there all burning, right? And if you had to put your money in economies of scale scrubbing, if you want to call it that, and you had a choice between coal into vehicles made liquid or biomass into vehicles, biomass is uh, CO2 neutral, right? So as bad as it is burning wood, right, you're actually, only, it's only a neutral uh, greenhouse gas issue. Now, particulate matters and health issues and stuff like that, that's, that's you know, the other part of the equation. So it's about carbon neutrality. That's what biofuels is all about, and guess what? What's our issue? At least if you buy kind of the summary slides right in the beginning. You have a question? So, you know, here's a, this makes your eyes bug out, but ultimately what it is is starting with how much we use, what's that in barrels, what's that in gallons, how many BTUs is that, what's the equivalent of joules, who wanted joules here, you want a joule, right? Uh, and in terms of percentage, I mean, basically, 
of all the sun that falls on the United States, including, I don't think this includes Alaska, you'd need 17% of the you know, land mass to grow yourself at today's efficiencies in terms of photosynthesis. You'd need 17% of our land mass, right? Now, 17% of arable land mass. Now, in that case, you need 45% of arable land mass. That's a, you know, what are we gonna eat? What's the world gonna eat if we do that? Uh, now, you know, my kind of goal, you know, just my kind of rule of thumb goal is we get 12% of our oil from the Middle East. It's getting worse, but let's try that as a first. Let's just, you know, see if we can get out of the Middle East. I mean, it's a, you know, that's, the, the, it's a world market, it, you know, that's nice, but it doesn't really, you know, ultimately oil is, uh, oil is uh, a problem in many ways. So this is just the simple fact of, if you talk about the efficiencies of photosynthesis, which on an aggregate basis is, extre you know, extremely powerful, but on our looking at it, sun, you know, plants are only 0.33% efficient to convert sun into carbon, right? Or, you know, energy. And so this whole thing is simply to say, if we were gonna displace 100% today, we'd need 45% of a layerable land mass. Uh, if we were gonna do 20%, 9%, if we were gonna displace the Middle East, it'd be 5%. And this is a, a right in line with, I do believe it with Vinod Khosla in the sense that, you know, I, I believe in technology, it's gonna happen. But this is a function of, what if you say, somehow we need to get twice as much energy out of those plants? Well, it can be a matter of crop choice. It can be a matter of, uh, you know, technology. It can be a matter of diesel engines versus gasoline engines, all those type of things. And let's just say, having not, we haven't focused on it yet. We focused on food. We haven't focused on energy crops and stuff like that. You know, in the end of the day, to display, if we would get a 5x improvement, and it's not, you know, some of it's going to come from uh, bioteching, some of it's going to come from choice of vehicles, some of it's going to come from, you know, what kind of, uh, you know, energy balance we have on the production process. But 1% is pretty, you know, I think we can do that. I don't think that's going to disadvantage anybody. And that's just a chart of the various ways to look at it. Is biofuel carbon neutral because the, you can only burn out the CO2 that the plant breathed in during its lifetime? Yeah. What about the... Uh, petroleum-based fertilizers used to grow the crops? Good question. Yeah. Um, How does that fit into the equation? Well, in terms of pollution of like the Mississippi and everything like that, that's a, you know, you need to factor that into the whole thing. Not even that, but we still need to, we still need to use petroleum-based fertilizers to grow these crops when quantities right. are needed. How do you limit, how does that affect your equation in terms right. of? Right, well, that's called field to wheel or well to wheel and stuff like that. Those energy balances, I believe, are factored in. Actually factored in? Yeah, I believe those are factored in. I have to go back and take a look at it. Fertilizer comes from petroleum. So the petroleum energy is used to fix nitrogen out of the air and then the best of the phosphorus. Because none of those things come from hydrocarbons. Right. Yeah. Okay. So they, you could use this instead of okay. oil. Sure. To, to sure. The fertilizer. Yeah, you know what? That reminds me too. I mean, the questions are really good here. So I'm going to repeat them, too, because that was one of the problems of listening to Vinod's talk was, oh, gosh, what did they just ask? Um, so he, the whirlwind tour of emissions is there's five regulated emissions, uh, volatile organic compounds, which, you know, Vinod talked about. Uh, he talked about, um, uh, you know, that's the problem if you don't, if you go less than, or you go between E5 and E85, you've got an increase in volatiles. Uh, carbon monoxide particulate matter, which is really the dangerous one in terms of carcinogens. Uh, sulfur oxides cause acid rain, all those type of things. Biofuels, there's none of that. And nitrogen oxides. Uh, the difficulty of diesel engines, because they burn at high temperatures, you take atmospheric nitrogen and you combine it with atmospheric oxygen and you get nitrogen oxides. So I need to talk about that in a second. And then finally, greenhouse gases, which is you know, follow the court docket about, you know, and California Resources Board in the battle to see if greenhouse gases are just a, you know, food for plants or, a, you know, a danger that should be regulated and can be regulated. Uh, and then here's ultimately this field to wheel emissions thing that's, you know, kind of filling in the blanks on other data that's already out there. You can see gasoline versus diesel. Diesel is kind of the zero line or the one line in this type of thing. 
greenhouse gases increase, significantly less particulate matter, uh, significantly less NOx, huge amount of VOCs compared to diesel and carbon monoxide, huge amount. Uh, the dangerous ones are the NOx, I mean, quite frank, uh, excuse me, particulate matter. NOx and VOCs combine to make smog. They have a certain, you know, problem there. But, you know, you can make, uh, I mean, the argument is you can make, you can pump up your tires so you use less gas. You know, efficiency would be the greatest. You can pass CAFE standards. But really, uh, my argument here is fundamentally it's the choice of vehicles. It's the choice of what you're using the feedstocks for and the conversion thing. Uh, all these other things I'm not, are actually more important, but this is, uh, this is kind of the policy slash, you know, follow the banner to change the world for the better thing that you can do on a macro level. Yeah. Uh, one question about particulates. Uh, is that uh, particulate count in comparison with uh, particulate filters on ULSD or, or US diesel? Um, I'm, I'm fairly certain that uh, they have better particulate scrubbers for vehicles running ultra wall sulfur diesel, right. uh, which could significantly affect that. Right. Yeah. I mean, the question was about the various kind of bins that vehicles go in to achieve this certain, uh, you know, this certain uh, uh, allowance, and that ultimately that it factors into a, a difficult combination in terms of are they meeting their emissions control requirements, and it's a fleet average in terms of emissions and all that type of thing, and in terms of fuel economy. Uh, but uh, oh, I'd. I, is available if you use a different level grade of diesel fuel. Correct. Yeah. So some, I mean, one of the arguments of using biofuels, because there's no sulfur in it, you know, sulfur ruins catalysts, so you can actually put, cat, you can put catalytic converters on diesel vehicles, for example. You know, it's, I don't want to get too far into it, and you ask very good questions, but ultimately, uh, yeah, let me leave it at that, and if you want to get deeper into that, you know, I'll be able to not answer your question. <laughs> uh, transportation and emissions, I kind of went into this. Uh, 600 million uh, vehicles out there, all uh, distributed emitters, very difficult to control. More, you know, more vehicles coming with China and India coming along. And, you know, again, biofuels are the greenhouse gas neutral, uh, you know, solution. And biofuels for transport, you know, kind of beat that in your... Uh, the challenges for diesel engines, oxides and not nitrogen, I already told you why diesel engines have problems with NOx, uh, particulate matter, and then ultimately there are technologies today, some would say, oh, you know, there's problems with them, but, you know, Mercedes, which is not a good example because it will be the, a very expensive vehicle, but it, it, in their example of, you know, coming through with solutions first, they've got the part particulate matter is solved. And in terms of the NOx reduction, you use urea and run it over a catalyst. And you know, if you can accept that you might run out of the catalyst and thus be out of compliance, which is the enviros, if I want to call them that, have a problem with that because it's not a perfect solution. But there is no kind of major invention to get to the point where diesel engines are in compliance to gasoline engines. My underlying argument is I think the paradigm for regulation is based on spark ignition engines. So where it's hard, you know, where it's e hard for uh, gasoline engines to make the emissions requirements, it's easy in terms of the regulations. And where it's easy, it's hard. And, you know, because they're just different diesel engines and, and gasoline engines, you know, diesels come along and they say, well, we've got everything solved except the NOx. And it's a, what do you want to call it, a sudden death, right? It's not a holistic. It's not a holistic approach to regulation. Meaning, within the context of oh gosh, 9/11 and oh gosh, terrorism, fuel by oil and stuff like that. But they're actually getting it in Sacramento. It's amazing. You know, uh, you know, I'm a graduate student. I've been trying to figure out what my dissertation topic is. Well, the darn thing's moving so fast. I can't find a topic because uh, you know, eventually they come to their senses before I can write something. Uh, and then finally, why is transportation so vulnerable? I would argue that transportation is, you know, the, this, the pinnacle of greenhouse gas control. I would also argue it's the pinnacle of, uh, in terms of vulnerability, in terms of petroleum use and everything like that. As you can see, electricity, you know, they're 3% 3 3 dependent on petroleum and, uh, and transportation is 98%. 
whoops. And uh, as you can see, you know, transportation is the bottleneck in terms of kind of foreign source oil de dependence, and again, I would argue greenhouse gases. So uh, I, conclusions, implications, or a kind of sub-conclusion, sub biomass is a limited and valuable resource. Transportation is the most vulnerable sector to petroleum disruption. Biomass is best suited to controlling emissions, greenhouse gases, and vehicles. BTL versus ethanol is ready and cheapest today and tomorrow. And diesel engines are more efficient and best suited for BTL. So if you follow that logic, that's what I'm trying to, <laughs> trying to say here. Now, talk about plug-in hybrids. You know, just because of feedstock and land use, I, th I think it's pretty widely acknowledged that biofuels are the 15% solution. So how are we going to get to the point, the other 85%? And plug-ins, which were very strong at, at, um, at UC Davis, we have the godfather of plug-in hybrids, uh, Professor Andy Frank, you know, they are, in my mind, the other 85% solution. And the fact that Google.org, you know, I think uh, gave the interview, and did, this wasn't an official announcement, but the fact that they're looking there is really smart. Uh, another example of Google in the lead, I've got to compliment you. So here's the fundamentals that make plug-in hybrids, in my mind, so exciting. 80% of households drive less than 60 miles in a day. So if you can get a car that will go 60 miles on battery only, you don't use any petroleum in that day. Uh, it's got huge mile per gallon. If you don't have the time to charge, which is the big bugaboo, one of the big bugaboos of electric vehicles, uh, it can be a vehicle like any other. It just works. You don't have that issue about, I can't go, you know, the 1%, I want to go 300 miles on a tank <laughs> or whatever. Uh, you know, it's there. Cold starts, believe it or not, are all the emissions in vehicles. That's it, you know? If, you can, if you've got two cold starts in a day and you eliminate one of those, huge reductions in emissions. Uh, and then the average vehicle stays stationary 19 hours a day. So one could argue that plugging it in, I mean, if anybody who's from the cold environments where they had to plug in their vehicle, so, you know, the block heater or something like that, right? Pain in the ass or that big a deal? And now I say, what if it was 70 cents a gallon versus $3 a gallon, right? You know, it's not that hard to think that the people can do it and there's inductive charging, which is, you know, no problem. And so, whoops. 70 cents a gallon or 70 cents a mile? 70 cents a gallon. Yeah, just the slide said 70 cents a mile. So. Okay, sorry, 2 a.m. again. I mean, not all of this was done at 2 a.m., but the ones where I made the mistake was done at 2 a.m. <laughs> um, so here's the, you know, here's the fundamental things that make plug-ins so powerful, right? If we could get, you know, 80% of all Americans drive less than 60 miles in a day, put a big battery in there, downsize the electric, you know, the, the engine, upsize the electric, excuse me, yeah, the motor, and uh, boy, you know, there's the 85% or 80% solution. And all of a sudden, you know, it's not, oh, every solution will work. You know, we need to fund everything. We need to, you know, everything's good. We all sing kumbaya. No, this is competitive, right? There is a best solution. I'm arguing this is the best solution. And all of a sudden, biofuels, with all their advantages, becomes the only solution. Because we're going to need the fuel, right? And, uh, and you put it into plugins. So the other thing about plug-ins, why it's only 70 cents a gallon uh, equivalent is it's, you know, the fact that we use all our energy during the day and we don't use any of it at night. And the power companies, their fixed costs, uh, they have to pay for it whether it's producing or not. And so the, the power companies are getting very excited as opposed to, I don't think they supported the electric vehicle that well or it was just a different time and not that big a deal or, you know, other issues were on their mind. Um, you know, this is where you can, uh, you can uh, peak smooth is what it's called. Now, you guys here at Google pay half on usage and another half on your peak load, right? So in theory, if we could give every of you a plug-in hybrid and plug it out, you know, valet parking at Google, uh, and Google pays for the differential of that it's a plug-in hybrid versus uh, an SUV or whatever you drive, hopefully not. Um, all of a sudden, you've got a lot of power there. I don't know how many people are in this whole entire complex, 5,000, something like that. You know, so I'll show you in a second that's a lot of power and has a lot of value. Uh, so that's another of the fundamentals. 
So uh, this is not that this is confidential, it's just kind of a joke on LA confidential, probably a bad one. But you know, the, what, these are the things that I've learned in you know, six months of looking at this intensely about plugins. Nickel metal hydrides are you know, the present best technology other than lithium ions, which is, has a nasty habit of going, getting up, catching on fire right now, which are great because they're half the weight and twice the, you know, all that you want in a battery. Nickel metal hydrides last the entire life of a vehicle, 150,000 miles. So that's one of the big issues was, did you have to replace the battery that made these non-commercially acceptable? Uh, cost per kilowatt, what's it cost to build a nat gas uh, electric plant? 1,500 bucks for nat gas and 2,500 for nukes, right? So 100 kilowatts, let's say, for a, a vehicle, right? What does that in terms of inherent value it's a huge amount, which I would suggest could subsidize Google, subsidizing the, you know, giving you a plug-in hybrid that costs no more than, you know, a hybrid or even a conventional vehicle. That's a lot of value. The, you know, if you take Intel, which, you know, I've had some discussions with, and you take their 6,000 employees in Folsom, unfortunately that probably numbers less as per the news and the, you know, the news, but that's the same as a 660 megawatt peaker, or has an inherent value of 990 million bucks. So these are things that change the paradigms in terms of business models of getting this to work. Uh, the other thing is, uh, I skip, but grid to vehicle, vehicle to grid is all very exciting. The other, uh, what I love about grid to vehicle down here is that what's the limitation of a kind of wind and solar? It's intermittent, right? Or it only comes, so if you have, if you're a power company and you say, geez, everybody's bought batteries that are connected into the grid. I don't have to pay for that fixed cost. I just have to pay the variable cost of paying you to, to hook up. So I can store some of my wind energy. I can store some of my solar. It's, you know, 600 million vehicles in the world and, you know, how many hundred, 150, 125 million here, the big battery to get to the P60 or the 60 mile range all of a sudden, you start combining these things, and it's not just a matter of, oh, diesel engines are more expensive. Yeah, well, they pay back. You know, you get your resale value back. Oh, plug-in hybrids, boy, that's another 10,000 bucks. Well, it's not then compared to what you could, would pay to have that generation possibility, and it's nothing compared to the, the storage capability. So, if it makes so much sense to do these hybrids, how come we have so many gasoline electric hybrids and no diesel electric hybrids in cars? Uh, well, so the question was why aren't hybrids here today? Or why are hybrids, you know, I, I, would, argue, I would argue that it's just a matter of evolution. That we've taken a detour into the hydrogen highway, uh, take that with a grain of salt, people that love hydrogen. Or that, or we went too soon to hydrogen is another is a nice way to say it, but ultimately the evolution is hybrids are, uh, you know, and the, the Japanese who are very incremental. Hybrids is the natural evolution off of vehicles. Plug-in hybrids, I would argue, are the natural evolution off of hybrid vehicles. So. Electric hybrids like this, but there are very few or no diesel electric hybrids as well. Why is that? Well, where, where are you talking? And I mean, you know, and diesels aren't here at all in the entire United States, despite the fact that they're overwhelming in the United in Europe. But Europe doesn't have a mind. Yeah, and the other thing, somebody said it was stupid, and I appreciate that comment. There is a problem. I mean, basically, electric motors and diesels have the same. They're essentially high torque at low speed, right? So they're not, you know, they're not the ultimate combination. What I'm arguing in a holistic sense is, okay, you sacrifice some by going to a diesel engine. Uh, you sacrifice some efficiencies in part in terms of going to a diesel engine. But holistically, if you take all the pieces together, you know, diesels are best suited for biofuels, which are best suited for, you know, greenhouse gas issues in combination. So that's you know where I'm going slightly out on a limb, and of course you'd want to see real numbers, and you know that's more than you're going to put out here. It, it'd be nice uh, that the um, pardon me, the diesel uh, electric hybrid actually would work fairly well because the diesels have good torque at low RPM, but only when their turbos are up to speed, and it's the turbo lag that actually makes them not such great performers. 
So uh, a diesel electric combo would actually be pretty good because it would be very responsive by comparison. Hey, any support is welcome. <laughs> no, the other thing too is that, uh, you know, I mean, a more layman's approach to, to that really perceptive uh, uh, thought is that, look, diesels are faster off the line. They're not as fast as the Tesla super rocket ship for, you know, very well-heeled consumers, but they're faster than gasoline engines, you know, for the most part, and that's why the Germans and everybody else are going crazy on them. So that's a, you know, more layman's approach to, yes, diesels work, you know, uh, sorry, I probably cut too thin a knife for, for, that, for that subject matter. Go ahead. This is just piggybacking on the, the question before last. Um, so is Mercedes or Volkswagen working on a hybrid diesel or turbo diesel engine? I heard the rumor. Uh, yes. I mean, it, it depends on what, you know, I take this with a grain of salt, what's working on, what's announced, and what's actual, right? Uh, you know, uh, in our interactions with VW, for example, through the university, essentially through me, I basically said, hey, you sell v diesel vehicles over here and nobody's buying, you know, you want them into this market, you should do whatever you can do. So, you know, I guess what I'm saying, what I'm saying is the automobile companies are incrementalists like anything else. The failings of Detroit is they have no plan B. You know, I hope they change that. They don't have the money to change that type of thing. Everybody's got somebody deep in the bowels of their company working on this, or is an expert on this whole thing. But to get from ground zero to actually production ready is a big jump. Uh, and so the sh short answer is yes, people are working on it. But the, the medium answer is, you know, they're probably working on hydrogen more than they're working on this specific subcomponent. And most of them aren't going to start with diesel hybrids. I'm going, you know, the f I'm trying to give you a kind of medium to long-term future approach to the whole thing. Is that a satisfactory answer? Sort of. I, mean, I feel like the Prius has been successful for several years now, and somebody from Volkswagen basically say, look, how successful these things are. We have kick-ass diesel engines. Let's combine them. Yeah. Well, I mean, again, successful and successful, right? 250,000 units in a 12 million market, right? And is it leveling off? Is it continuing? They don't, plugins don't pay back in their lifetime of ownership. So is it, have we soaked up all the green Enviro people that, you know, want to look cool? The issues on, the, the issues on, uh, you know, Civic, the Honda doesn't sell, the Prius does. Some people say it's just because one looks cool versus the other. I think those are bad signs when you, you know, people aren't buying for efficiency and, and type of thing like that. So, go ahead. Uh, I was going to say that uh, Opal has a diesel electric hybrid in the building. And, uh, Opal is a unit of GM. So, it's the Astra. It's supposed to come out in like 2008 or something. A lot of power in this oh. room. Yeah, a lot of power in this room. Uh, and then finally, I would argue that uh, plug in hybrids are perfect for homeland security and disaster response. You know, if you ever look at the marketing material for hydrogen vehicles, it's you can go to the beach and have a rock concert, Burning Man off of the hydrogen, right? Well, you can do that with diesel plug. You know, you can do it on battery only with uh, plug-in hybrids type of thing. And, you know, one could also argue that the Homeland Security people or even the people over in Iraq, I mean, what's the, why are people screaming and yelling over there? One of the arguments is the power doesn't work. They've got plenty of oil. They need generators. We either buy them generators or we combine them in a, in a, in a plug-in. So again, not to belabor the point, you've seen this as a reiteration. Now, um, actually, how are we doing in terms of, hey, Joel? Five minutes. Five minutes in terms of it's 55 minutes or 45 minutes? 55. Okay, good. Um, so business model politics, not technology, is the key. My quick story of my grandfather, he was a pharmacist for 94 years, 90, 90 years. One day I look over his shoulder and he's mixing up this cream and I say, hey, Gramps, what's that? And this is old time pharmacy where you'd custom order the thing. And he says, oh, it's a cream. I said, what's it for? He says, oh, it's for my customer, he's got genital herpes. And I go, wow, that's pretty bad. Is that just to soothe it or something? He goes, no, it cures it. I go, wait a minute, excuse me, it cures that? It's incurable. He goes, no, it's not incurable. 
I said, I said, that's a billion dollar product, right? And he says, no, it's not, because you need an infrastructure of compounding pharmacists. This thing's off the patent. I got it out of the library, right? And, uh, and it needs, it's got low shelf life. He says, that is not a commercial product, right? In the same way, biofuels, I would argue there are no, I mean, this is a, you know, it's like hit it with a sledgehammer is big business, right? I would say for biofuels, the difficulty of it, it's so exciting, you can make it in your bathtub and stuff like that, is for 80% of the problem, there's no proprietary position, and that doesn't jive with business as it's done today in the venture capital world and everything like that. So actually, I love to see Google.org kind of bridging those type of problems. Uh, there's no, there, it's not an investment, it's a business. Pricing of petroleum is unfair, as we know. Uh, you know uh, pricing of petroleum is a, a boom and bust cycle. I think prices will go down, uh, unfortunately, and you know, just like ethanol died the first death, without subsidies, alternatives have a problem, or fair pricing, they have a problem. And pl things like Google.org is sorely needed. So here's a, something I would suggest for new paradigms for business models. You know, I've already talked about the grid to vehicle and vehicle to grid idea to give you guys all plug-in hybrids at the cost of a regular vehicle because Google makes money and changes the world for the better. My other idea is how, does car, how do cars go into um, production for the automobile uh, companies? Well, a rough way to say it is you've got to have 100 prototypes that are ready to the point where they drive 100,000 miles and don't break down. So I have called this the Automotive Usability and New Technology Test Program, which is we get 100 prototypes, we drive them around the headquarters of Detroit of the major auto companies, we test them head to head with the, you know, they're just retrofits, so they're not that fancy. The retrofits of their original vehicles, and Google on its website, or, you know, on its homepage, or you know, pretty close to it. Anybody remember Quaka.com? These are the guys. Yeah, one person back there. These are the guys that would do the world-class athlete biometrics. That's what I'd love to see at, at Google, right? Biometrics, meaning miles per gallon, savings, all the type of things that really people make decisions on whether cars work or not. Did they break down? Did they not break down? All that kind of stuff. So, you know, first you want to ask nicely, but second of all, maybe the Taunt program, aptly named, uh, can solve that. In terms of X Prize has an automotive prize, uh, and then I've got some ideas in terms of uh, aggregating restaurant grease and you know, doing what's called transit-oriented development. So, these are all things that you know. What's the technology here? I, I would argue it's not. There's not a lot of technology. Here's an example of kind of the oil field in Davis, where we come from. There's 108 restaurants, 69 of which produce restaurant grease. Um, and so, you know, again, as I said, biodiesel, there's not, not enough, but there's some. And, you know, a billion, billion gallons of displacement is better than nothing, especially when the emissions go down. And then, you know, kind of the un, just like with plug-in hybrids, where you sit here and say, what's the value of you know, 16 kilowatts in a vehicle times $2,500, you know, the, this is the inherent value in plug-ins, uh, what's the value of renewable resources? And I would argue you can value that against what's the value of reserves for an oil company. And c if it's domestic feedstocks, then it's, uh, you know, there's no risk to it. And this is just a diagram of how people say what are the risks, and you can put a number to that. So here's some thoughts for Google, Googlers, right? My son thinks I'm a rock star that I'm coming here. So, you know, with that spirit, uh, you know, you guys can change the world and are already changing it. Thank you for your products. They're unbelievable and keep it up, right? So, uh, you know, again, don't be scared understanding the simple and ubiquitous mechanical technologies, right? Uh, vehicles, fuels, distribution, and infrastructure. Uh, I would argue, this is my Jones, obviously, somebody needs to be held accountable for hydrogen. <laughs> uh, you know, and we should not be led into our next phase of, you know, the future by the people that, you know, we're pushing hydrogen because there's just so, some fundamental issues that should have caught, people should have caught. Uh, history and fundamentals are important. Uh, not all alternatives are created equal. You know, there's this kind of kumbaya mentality of all alternatives are good. No, there's better alternatives than others, and I'd be, you know, glad to go head to head and 
you know, change the world for the better and, and get resources to the best. Uh, follow the money when it comes to stories and credibility. Uh, you know, understand that the calling for perfection is the enemy of the good. You've probably heard that before. And, uh, you know, even question the good guys. Because the adversarial system yeah, makes for extremism and makes us go for suboptimal decisions. Uh, you know, no, there's, everybody could win in theory if hydrogen would work. But, where, you know, does, is that the solution? And I think... You know, my background, I'm in a, as long in the tooth grad student as you're here. There's advantages of being in the 40s when you're in grad school. There's disadvantages. Uh, uh, consultant to a number of companies in this area. Ten years in venture capital backed life sciences, Europe finance and operations, and kind of five years USMC infantry officer. And that's how I got into this a mere four years ago. And I've, you know, not, not taken my education and uh, monetized it as ne possible because I was sitting on 101 in my gas-guzzling SUV, looking at you know, the waste, listening to the war news. In those days, you know, there weren't as many dead Americans and dead Iraqis at the point. And my buddy pulls up in a uh, VW turbo diesel wagon running on used cook and grease biodiesel. And that's why I am here today, for better or for worse. And so if you have some time for questions, I appreciate it. Uh, I'll try to relay them. Some of the questions are so good, I, you know, it's tough to even translate them. And, Please go to the microphone. Are there any of these, uh, you said the biomass stuff you can do actually in your bathtub. Is there something that, uh, you know, if I wanted to go out and start a cult in some, uh, in, in the middle of the Midwest or something, is there something that I could actually afford that would produce this stuff? Yeah. Um, yes. I mean, the first issue is there, is there enough of it? So what you want is like, chi you know, the Chinese restaurant central where there's nobody going to the Chinese restaurants. And, uh, you know, there's an issue of there's not enough of it. But you can make this in your bathtub. Of course, you know, I'm going to be put on record. There's liabilities and dangers in the whole thing. But, you know, go to Google.com and search on, search on making this. Uh, there's plenty of people out there selling kits. There's plenty of user groups that are real friendly and trying to help you out. There's people that are producing biodiesel already. You know, they just don't send less than 300 gallons. So kind of organizing to be part of those groups is the way to get at that type of stuff. And, you know, if you want to save the fuel taxes and you've got a friend who's got a Chinese restaurant, I don't know if it works, you know, off in uh, wherever your survivalist community, but. Yeah, I mean, this is, you know, this is 1900s era technology, 1900s, 1940s technology is nothing new. Is this the best of the, is this better than, is it easier than ethanol and easier than the other alternatives? Well, again, uh, you know, Vinod said it's just fermentation, right? So if you, you know, I brewed, brewed beer, I brewed beer, uh, you know, if you want to ferment, uh, you know, the, you got to decide, you could just go to Costco, I hear it's really cheap to buy just soybean oil and you can put it right in your diesel assuming the temperature's right, right? Uh, I think fermentation's more difficult than this, but, you know, it's really not a significant difference. Just started to answer one of my questions, which is, so, there's sort of two ways people use biodiesel. One is to use biodiesel that's actually been I don't know what the term is, but you know the, the lye process where it's been turned into actual diesel fuel, and the other is just to use the fuel oil that's filtered. And I've seen uh, examples where people have additional equipment that preheats heats the oil. Is it, do you think that that's a viable alternative, um, or is that too expensive in terms of the equipment that you have you to know, put on? I mean, for the people that plug in or lived up in Wisconsin or something like that, it's a block heater and a fuel line heater, right? Uh, you know, so if you don't, if you, if you don't want to have a block, if you want to run straight vegetable oil and you don't want to uh, add the extra expense of a second tank or the block heater, I mean, or stuff like that. I mean, it's really a function of your own economics of do you want to spend $2,000 for this or $2,000 for that? I guess uh, the uh, follow-up question is, is there any environmental issues with the, the process of turning the vegetable oils into diesel fuel? 
in terms of like what happens to the lye when you wash it away? And, yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, as a catalyst, the definition of catalyst is you recover them, but are your processes so good that you're going to get the catalyst? Are there volatiles, right? I mean, it's immaterial in the greater scheme of things, because, but yeah, these are quote unquote unregulated emitters of emissions. And yeah, if you're, I mean, you're really into it, which is really fun. You're, what's your footprint on the planet uh, saving the world while you're, you know, creating worse emissions than if you just went and fueled up at the gas station type of thing. I mean, yeah, you can get, you can get into the, all those and it will make your head spin. <laughs> Um, I was hoping to find out more uh, selfishly about the straight vegetable oil option mm -hmm. because I have access to it pretty easily being a chef. Um, <laughs> and <laughs> I'm interested, so partially because I'm a chef, partially because I'm interested, I'm really interested in the biodiesel option. Um, and I know that I could get free, you know, free fuel that I could just put straight into my tank. And I know I don't have time to play in my bathtub and make it, you know, right. into biodiesel. So. I was just wondering what you, I was hoping to find out more about what I have to do to get a car that will run on straight ve vegetable oil and what are the relative benefits or is there anything, anything known about, you know, how well the car will hold up over time and things like that. Yeah, wow, good questions. Um, I mean, first of all, don't turn around so they won't get you on tape. This, this young lady's in a uh, catering for Google outfit, so I'm, I'm wondering where she could get the free vegetable oil from. <laughs> um, Oh, use vegetable oil. Okay, uh, use vegetable oil. I mean, it's about it's all about temperature, right? If you're in Arizona, you can again, you know, sue me, and I'm on tape, right? If you're in Arizona, it all works, right? It's all a function of temperature. I guess in the general group, is it a reliable like thing to do with your engine? So several, a couple of Googlers already. Take oil from the cafe yeah. and use it. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, look, I mean, this is, this is like. In terms of, in terms of the, all, you know, it's really kind of, I mean, this is, what do you want to call it? Home brewing, right? You can make your own beer, you can make your own vodka, you can make your own house, you get, you know, everything's possible, right? You can, you, Everything's possible, kind of, and it depends on what you want to do and how much effort you want to put into it. Is it cheaper? You know, the short answer is no. I, I don't think it's going to end up cheaper. It's the same thing as uh, 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 hybrid vehicles, right? They don't pay off in the seven years. Uh, but that, you know, does it is does it empower you? Can you realize that, you know? I'll, the society as we have today is doesn't have to be that way. You know, you, it's great stuff. And uh, I'd encourage you to try it. And, you know, also that's a political movement of people that just won't buy the system as it is. Because you see where, what's possible and what isn't. That's a macro answer to a good question. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah, this, this brought me to my, my own question about, you know, supply. Uh, once all early adopters have, you know, are basically taking all the Google grease and burning it, you come in and you say, oh, this, this, this is a great thing to burn vegetable oil, except, you know, there's nothing left. I mean, does, has anybody done any calculations on how much supply there is? And yeah, there's 750 million gallons if we got every restaurant in the country. Which would supply how many cars? Yeah, we use, we use 40 billion gallons a year of diesel fuel in the United States. Plus a lot of that diesel fuel goes to the shipping industry that, uh, that uses, yeah, most, most of the diesel, the reason we don't see a whole lot, of, one of the reasons we don't see a whole lot of diesel cars is because most of it is used for cross-continental uh, shipping trucks instead of either Slightly, well, slightly more efficient rail systems, and just the fact that the, the country is physically so big, it takes a lot more fuel to get stuff from place to place. Yeah, well, the 40 billion number, I, that's every, everything in there, and there's very few diesel passenger vehicles, and why? Because you can't sell them in California, and that's the biggest part of the market, and all the things that come to it. But we use a lot of diesel fuel, we use a lot of gasoline, and, you know, again, uh, that's not the, you know, the long term, it's supply constrained in terms of kind of the technologically easiest approach, not the cheapest approach. Uh, 
but the technolo you know, technology, technological okay. easiest possible. Correct, and that's also a function of you know nation to nation competitiveness and all that kind of stuff. So we'll have to build plug in. Uh, there's a Fremont Toyota GM plant, I think, right? And there's nothing else in California. Why? It's extremely high price. But I, I, let's build a plug-in hybrid uh, diesel uh, biofuel focused uh, production facility right here in California. That would be great. There's a lot of jets biodiesel. Yeah, well, actually, this is a really interesting thing that Vinod um, talked about in terms of Richard Branson and his approach to, uh, you know, putting uh, biofuels into that. I'm a pilot. You don't test things that in flight. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Especially things that are like uh, uh, temperature dependent. I guess is the way to say it. You can just throw, you know, a small percentage of ethanol into any fuel. Diesel, you can throw ethanol into. It's e-diesel and e-gasoline you know, gasoline and everything like that. But, you know, I, that's just, you know, there's certain things that petroleum are absolutely spectacular for, meaning, you know, things that you don't want to mess up, right? Oh, we have a jet in the company. Oh, you have a jet in the company. So, <laughs> yeah, it's a great idea. No, just kidding. I, I don't know what the, I'm trying, I don't remember the, the uh, chemical comparison between kerosene and aka jet a jet a i mean it, it is kind of diesel yeah kerosene is you know it's a he it's slightly heavier than diesel fuel right, right? i just don't know what, what the compatibility of of the some of the carbons is in comparison to diesel. yeah no it, it's diesel fuel or you know we're putting jet fuel in into our cars or our trucks we should make this a small group discussion. Okay. I need my laptop now. Okay. So please come up and talk to, to uh, Reed. So thanks a lot, guys. Thanks a lot, Reed. Appreciate it.